This is Jason Romano, host of the Sports Spectrum Podcast, and you're listening to Success is a Choice with Jamie Beckler. Providing insights to help you grow your business, improve yourself, and add value to those around you. You're listening to the Success is a Choice Podcast, where you get a peek into the lives of industry leaders as they share their stories with you. Welcome to Success is a Choice Podcast. I'm your host, Jamie Beckler, and we're really excited to talk to today's guest. Michael Catt is the pastor of Sherwood Baptist Church in Albany, Georgia, which has a congregation of more than 3,000 people. If that name sounds familiar, that's because his church has produced major films like Facing the Giants and Fireproof. Michael has served as the executive producer of Woodlawn, a film by the Irwin Brothers about the impact of the Jesus movement on an Alabama high school football team back in the 70s. Pastor Cat has authored 12 books, including The Love Dare Curriculum and Fireproof Your Life. He is the founder of the nationally renowned Refresh Conference, and like any fine, upstanding Southerner, he is also an avid SEC football fan. Pastor Cat, welcome to the show. Thank you, Jamie. It's good to be with you. Did you ever think that your great conference, the Refresh Conference, would be in the same breath, the same sentence as being an avid SEC football fan? No, I, I did not. I didn't even think we would make the halftime show. <laughs> well, you know, you never know. You never know where the punctuation comes in, and, and I must have forgotten that's a true. punctuation mark or something about that. But uh, one of the statements that's been made about your guys' church is that you know, you were trying to change the world from Albany, Georgia. And one way that you did this or have been able to do this is, is through the movie ministry, which is, which is unique for a church. But your church made mainstream movies. You know, I mentioned Facing the Giants and Fireproof. How did this idea come about, and what has it meant to your church? Well, it came about actually on a, a staff retreat. Uh, I was picking off uh, staff members one at a time and just saying, okay, give me your your vision, your passion, your thoughts over the next three to five years. And uh, we were actually at Disney. We had done a behind-the-scene tour of uh, Disney World, and we were on the parade route right where it starts. And I pulled Alex Kendrick aside. I said, okay, tell me what you're thinking. And he said, well, you know, I would like to make Christian movies, but I don't think I could ever do that and be on a church staff. And I said, why not? bring me a script and bring me a budget and let's look at it and let's just see if God's in this. And so he did. And that's when we made Flywheel. We made it for $20,000. Uh, it looks like a $20,000 film. It's still my favorite one because of the story in it, but it all began, uh, at Disney world where, you know, where dreams come true. So Alex's dream Uh, of making Christian films came there, and the way it's impacted our church is we've had people from, I think, 45 states, 12 or 13 countries that have come and visited. Uh, The movie is available in over 140 companies, uh, countries, and I think 20 languages right now. It's been shown on uh, Turkish Airlines in Beirut, Lebanon in prime time. In uh, Cuba, in prime time, they showed Courageous and Fireproof. Uh, I think I think Flywheel actually has been seen by over 100 million people uh, in Spanish-speaking countries. So, you know, to say that could ever happen out of something that came out of a church is just a miracle. And those movies are, uh, they achieved a lot of mainstream success, and they're not subtle. It's pretty uh, blatant. There's a Christian theme to them. Yes, and that was intentional for us. Uh, You know, we kind of knew where our market was and what we were trying to do. We wanted a film that uh, one of our church members could take an unchurched friend to and let them see the movie and hear a clear presentation of who we are and what we believe and why we believe it. And it has been amazing. I think... um, Jamie, the last numbers I saw, which would have been several years ago, we've probably had 10,000 people that we know have come to faith in Christ through Fireproof, and maybe we've heard from 40,000 marriages. And that's people that have to find us. It's not like at the end of the movie it says, email us at this. You know, They've got to go online and find us to even send us anything. 
what do you think is easier? You were the executive producer on some of these films. Is is being a, an executive producer or acting in them, which you did in some of them, or preparing a, a sermon on Sunday mornings? Which one's difficult? <laughs> Actually, executive producer is the easiest because you just, they give you the idea and you either do thumbs up or thumbs down. It, you know, it's kind of like the point guard saying, I think we ought to run this play and you go, okay. <laughs> or, or like an armchair quarterback? Yes, yes, exactly, exactly. So you just give a thumbs up and uh, they go with it. So that it's that is obviously the easiest. After 28 years here, uh, preaching sermons, you kind of go, gosh, have I, have I said this before? Yes, I have, but I might need to say it again. <laughs> so has there been any point in your career, in, in your life, where you've said, introduced yourself as a movie star? No. I have a face for radio. I, I don't, you know, I'm not good on, on the camera, so. Well, that's why we have you on our podcast today. This is not a that's right. podcast. That's right. Nobody has to look at me while they listen to this. There we go. Now, you wrote a book that kind of piggybacked on uh, Fireproof. It's called Fireproof Your Life, and it was the fastest-selling book in CLC Publications history. You know, certainly it got some momentum from the movie, but it was also probably popular because it deals with a topic that we tend to all face, you know, and, and we all are looking for answers to. We all have some kind of trials, tribulations, challenges that, that come our way. What are some ways that we can prepare for those trials and challenges? I think, Jamie, first thing, you, you've got to admit that they're a reality. Uh, we, we don't live in la-la land, and we do have to leave Disney World at some point. And you, you have to live in a real world that understands that there's pain and sorrow uh, because we live in a fallen world. We live in a very sad world, and there are sad consequences to all of our lives. It's not if we're going to have trials. And temptations it's when and I think the second thing is we need to not be asking the why question why did this happen to me why did God let this happen to me we need to ask the what now question in light of this what do I need to do third thing I think we've got to do is learn to walk slowly through a crowd because everybody we meet is hurting uh, they, they are broken hearts. This is a, for many people, Christmas and Thanksgiving and holidays are terrible times because there's just so much pain that comes back into their hearts and minds. And, and I think we just have to learn to listen and walk slowly, not get bitter uh, about it, let, let God make us better in it. My, my friend Ron Dunn used to say, Good and evil run on parallel tracks, and they normally arrive about the same time. And I think that's a great way to think about trials and tests. It's not that there's all good or all evil. you got both going on all the time. Well, like we said in the introduction, you've written 12 books. Is that right, 12 books? I think that's right. Your new book is entitled The Power of Purpose, Breaking Through to Intentional Living. It was uh, released back in October, October of 2017. What made you want to write this book, and how is this book relevant today, even though it's based upon the Apostle Paul's letter to the Philippians way, way back in the day? Well, you know, Paul, I really built it. The idea came when I was uh, preaching through Philippians and when I came to a very familiar verse for me to live as Christ and to die as gain. And as Matt Chandler says, we, we make verses like that coffee cup verses, and we put them on a plaque or put them on a coffee cup, but that's all they mean to us. But when I looked at the whole letter in light of that statement, that basically what Paul was saying was, here's my purpose. If I live for anything other than Christ, and magnifying him with my life, then dying is losing. Uh, and, I, and he gave us a summary statement, what, what I would say is his mission statement, his purpose statement, and his epitaph in one verse in just a handful of words, which really fits in a Twitter and soundbite world. You know, can you define your life in one sentence, why you're here and what you're here for? And I found Paul had purpose in everything, how he dealt with critics and opposition, how he prayed, 
how he fought, let this mind be in you, all of that. Everything about that book was purposeful uh, to a church that he obviously dearly loved. And he's writing to all of them, not just a few of them, and telling them how to think and how to live and how to function and, and I think how to be purposeful. Well, you mentioned there's a lot of good Twitter verses or, or things from that. You know, if anyone follows you on social media, they know that you uh, try to be pretty positive, try to have uh, the proper perspective on life. What, what would be some of your advice for people out there? You know, we seem to have a supercharged world where, you know, people are disagreeing with others and they're getting mean spirited. They're calling names. Uh, they're attacking others. What would be your advice to people on Twitter or how to handle disagreements? Well, I wish I was always positive, but uh, there have been more times than I would care to think about where I've, I've typed out something and I've just sat back and said, now, do I really want that statement to stand out there by itself? Uh, does anybody understand the context in which I'm saying that or what I am responding to? And so sometimes I just have to count to 10 or put my phone down and say, I'm going to pick it up again and think about it for a minute, uh, that I don't overreact. I think the, the instant access of Internet and technology and social media makes us quick to speak and slow to listen, and it's supposed to be just the opposite. And it, You know, for me, there's just some things not worth it. I, I chose to not be vocal about politics about two years ago because I just realized I was alienating people that I really wanted to reach and touch and influence that may disagree with me politically but not disagree with me on some other things. And so did I want a broader platform uh, to say, you know, this is how we need to think um, because I've, I'm just growing to learn, Jamie, that as an evangelical and as a pastor, that I need to use Twitter as a tool to show the distinctive difference that Christ can make, not just what my opinion was when I put my feet on the floor this morning. And sometimes I just send a private message. You know, if they're following me, I just send a private message and say, hey, can you clarify what you were thinking? Or I like that thought or something besides just liking it. I try to have communication with them privately. Well, you made a good point when you said that there might be somebody out there that disagrees with you politically but doesn't disagree with you on other things. But it seems like, you know, we don't even get to that point a lot of times is that if we disagree with somebody on something – then we automatically tune them out or resort to name calling. And yet we'll go to a sporting event. We don't know what the person next to us, their political affiliation or their opinions are, but man, we're high fiving them when, when we have something in common, when our team scores or whatever. And it seems like we need more of that attitude of, of coming together. Oh, absolutely. I, we are in such a time of angst and anger and distrust uh, and considering how fast this has happened, and people say, well, it's always been there, it's always been there. Yes, but we've never had 24-7 instant access to anybody's opinion like we do now. You know, you, you waited five days for the letter to get there or the telegraph or whatever, and, and now you can be anywhere in the world in less than 24 hours. You can send a message to someone anywhere in the world in a matter of seconds, and we just need to pause and think, you know, where is this going to leave our children? What, what are they going to do? Because if we're this amped up right now, then what's going to happen 20 years from now? I mean, are we, are we going to be threatening each other uh, over social media? Is it going to get to that? Because we did not know and, and understand self-control. I think that's a real issue. So sometimes with social media, we give no evidence of self-control. We'll return to the interview with Michael Catt shortly, but I want to take a moment to mention something that goes hand in hand with what Pastor Catt has been passionate about his entire career, and that is making a difference in the lives of people and making the community better. You know, Frederick Douglass once said that it's easier to build strong children than it is to repair broken men. 
Well, we've put together a book that helps young people learn how to be better leaders and to be better teammates, whether they're in sports or one day in a job. It's called the Leadership Playbook, Become Your Team's Most Valuable Leader. You see, when we help develop today's students, we also help influence the future. Please visit theleadershipplaybook.com to learn more about this impactful book. And now back to more insights from Pastor Cat. Now, you've been pretty active in, in racial reconciliation and have even received the MLK Unity Award. What do you think needs to happen to ensure that we're continuing to progress toward more unity, harmony, or community when it comes to race relations in our country? Well, I, I grew up in the 50s and 60s, which was a time of segregation. And I distinctly remember I went to this little drive through that was not far from my home uh, called the Tasty Freeze. And an African-American man, probably, I guess, I was eight or nine years old, and he was probably in his 40s or 50s, and he went up and asked for ice cream. And the gentleman behind the counter, who I knew, said, we don't serve your kind here. And even as an eight-year-old, I thought, why not? What's wrong with him? He's got a quarter in his hand to pay for the ice cream cone. Why, why wouldn't you serve him? And then he proceeded, the, the, the man that owned the place, proceeded to spend five minutes explaining to me why he didn't have to serve somebody like that. And even as an eight-year-old that didn't know God, I knew that was wrong. And when I became a Christian in my teens, God just opened my eyes to a world that has different traditions, different backgrounds, uh, different ways of thinking of things. And when Paul spoke to the church, he didn't say, okay, now I'm just going to talk to the Jews here. I'll get to you Gentiles later. Uh, he basically, if I can just paraphrase what I think Paul was thinking, was he said, look, here's the word to the church, Jews, Gentiles, Ethiopians, Romans, slave free. It doesn't matter who you are. Uh, learn under the power of God to get along. And we've lost that. Um, uh, one of my best friends is Daniel Simmons, who's pastor of the largest African-American church here in town, predominantly African-American. Uh, he's the fifth pastor of that church, no, sixth, uh, since 1864. He and I talk a lot. And so if I have an issue or an idea or a concern, I call him. I say, okay, tell me how I need to think. Tell me what you're thinking and tell me how I need to think. If he has one, he calls me. It's, it's communication. It's dialogue. It, it's building bridges, not walls, uh, between people to learn how to talk. Daniel and I have never talked politics, and we've known each other 25 years. We never talked politics. Uh, he and I would probably disagree on some political issues. But for us, it's the high ground of preaching the Bible and, and exemplifying Christ is more important than who he voted for or who I voted for. And so I think we've got to work harder and go further and do it more often. If we want to build those kind of relationships, you have to work at it. Mm, good words. In uh, 2002, you visited the White House, took part in a small meeting of religious leaders with President George Bush. What was that experience like going to the White House? It was a great experience. Uh, there were eight of us there. Uh, it sounds like the beginning of a joke. There was a Jewish rabbi, a, a Catholic priest, an Episcopalian priest, an uh, Assembly of God preacher, and I was the only Southern Baptist uh, preacher in the room. Uh, so we, we walked in, introduced ourselves, stood behind the Resolute desk, and stood behind, and then he just toured us verbally around the room and said, this is why this picture is here. This is why I have the sculpture here. This is the rug that uh, Laura picked out. This is what happens over here. And there were only, I think, four people on his staff in the room besides us. It was very warm, um, very friendly, you know, not a lot of air uh, and posturing about it. It may have been more posturing with the pastors than there was uh, with the president, but uh, it was just an incredible place to realize you're in a place of power, but uh, he made us feel very welcome, used a sense of humor, and uh, exemplified, I think, some really good leadership in that room. What are your thoughts on leading 
at a national level or, or maybe not national level, but from a public eye standpoint. So like a, a George Bush or a Barack Obama or, a, or you know, the, the Bill Gates, uh, you know, that level of leadership. Do you have some thoughts on that? And maybe does it differ from local or, or smaller leadership? Well, I think, you know, a leader is a leader. And, and you know, the, you know, Max, Maxwell says leadership is influence. And whether you're the mayor or the county sheriff or you're the president, you've got influence. And what you say matters. And not only what you say, but how you say it matters. And you can't take it back. Uh, and to, to tone and uh, facial expressions, all those things matter. I, um, I think leaders can get caught in the trap of trying to be liked and like everybody else, and their positions do not always allow them to do that, which goes back to you know social media and things like that. I mean, you don't have to say everything you think, and if you do, then when you say things that are really important, they may get watered down, or they may be totally missed. Um, I think there's a lack of leadership, a growing lack of leadership in the evangelical community, uh, that we have lost our voice trying to be something that maybe we're not. Uh, we, we have a very distinct calling to be salt and light, when you try to be the dessert and everything else, at some point, you quit being salt and light. And in leadership, to me, no matter what it is, it's salt and light. Uh, Bush showed us a picture of the sun rising over the East Tennessee hills. And he said, you know, everybody has one or two viewpoints in life. He said, either the sun is coming up and it's a new day, or the sun is going down and the day is over. He said, for me, when I look and think about America, I'm always thinking the sun is coming up. It's a new day. And sometimes we have leaders who just wear us down with the sun is going down. You need to give up hope. You need to give up visions and dreams. It's never going to be as good as whatever. And, and they suck the life out of a room. I think a leader's got to put air into the room, not suck life out of it. We, we talked about when we were talking about the movies that you wanted to change the world from Albany, Georgia. Well, there's a lot of people that say something to the effect, well, I'm only one person or I can't do anything or, you know, what would my vote matter? Or if, you know, no one will listen to me, those kind of things. What would you say to somebody to help them make a difference, you know, dependent, no matter what their role is or no matter where they're at in life? Well, well, that's a, that's a loaded one. Um, I would say, first of all, everybody thinks it's better somewhere else. Uh, every player thinks that. Every coach thinks that. Every business thinks that. Uh, Albany, Georgia, had in Albany, had about 110,000 people in it when I moved here 28 years ago. There are about 75,000 people in the town. We've lost two or three major industries. We're the fourth poorest city in America. We're number 10 in identity theft. And yet, God has uh, kept us here. And in the middle of all of that, we started a movie ministry. So I think for the people that are saying, well, if, if I were here or if I were there or if I had your money or if I had your title or your degree, I could really be somebody. You've got to start where you are. And, and quit living in, in a la-la land of, if I could. And you got to start where you are, and you have to start with what you have. And then be tenacious and focused about it. I mean, every day for us as a church is a battle. I mean, we do not live in an easy town. 32 gangs are in our town. So we either pull down the shades and triple lock the doors and hope for the best, or we go out and make an impact. Um, I think, Jamie, the other thing is, and you know this from your experience, uh, people tend to get restless at the first sign of trouble, and they start looking for ways out. And it may be that the trouble is what's going to make them what they're going to be. For instance, when I came to Sherwood, we were very uh, lily-white, southern gospel, did not look like our community at all. 
And my first five years here were not easy years. They were tough, hard years. But we stayed. And because we stayed, some people came and some people left. And the reason we were able to do the movies is because the people that would have fought that idea left because they didn't like the changes that were going on. And if they had been here, we may have never done it because they would have wanted to form a committee, to vote on it, to have a say in how everything was done. And by the time we made the movies, I simply got up and made an announcement on a Sunday morning and said, look, here's where we are, here's what we're going to do, and if God's in it, we'll get the money. Five days later, we had the money. So you, you earn the right to be heard, and I think you earn the right to be followed. And that comes with time. It doesn't come with titles. It comes with time. Has there been a time, maybe even before Sherwood, but, but since you've been there, that you faced obstacles or challenges that you didn't really overcome at the time, but, but they proved to be good lessons or maybe a favorite failure that you have? Uh, well, my favorite, <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I won't say it's my favorite failure, but the thing that I did not handle well was when I was 39 years old, I found out I was adopted. And uh, my parents had never said anything. I found out uh, from the social worker that handled my adoption talking to my mother-in-law, who had no idea. And so for about a year, I was not in a good state of mind. Uh, I was angry. I was frustrated. I probably took it out on everybody I knew. Um, I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what to say. I didn't know who I was, you know, and all the things that had been said to me growing up, I, I was questioning, was that really true? Do they really mean that? Or is this just all a part of the facade in the game? So I would say that was my worst handling of any situation I ever got thrown. I mean, I've been in tough meetings and business meetings and dealt with strong men, but nothing took the wind out of me and the legs out from under me like that did. You know, you give, you give, give, give as a, as a pastor and you help lead people. What are you doing to ensure that you grow and develop and, and to fill up your tank? I go to uh, the Billy Graham Training Center every year. Uh, I'll pick a pastor, either somebody like a Jim Cimbala or a Erwin Lutzer, uh, somebody that I highly respect and just want to sit and listen and I go and sit on the front row, and I take notes, and I listen. I try to do a meal with one of them if I can, just to pick their brains uh, and see what they have to say. That's where I met Warren Wiersbe, who's written 250 books. Uh, I met him at the Cove and developed a friendship with him. Uh, so I go and listen. I, you know, I, I learned early by the grace of God. I learned early I don't have to be on the program to be at the program. I can just go and sit and listen and learn. And, and I never learn talking. I always learn when I'm listening. Um, I listen to podcasts. Uh, I try to read a variety of books, whether they're history or biography or theology or, or whatever they might be, to try to keep growing and thinking and learning. My wife wants to know why I keep buying books. Because she said, you've got 10,000 and you haven't read them all. I said, but there's another one out there that I really need. <laughs> do you only read like the good old-fashioned books, or do you have a tablet or a Kindle that you use? I have a Kindle. I have probably, um, I've probably got 500 books on my Kindle. And part of that uh, I use when I'm traveling, so I don't carry a handful of books with me in my briefcase. I can just pull it out on a plane and and start reading, and then I, I have a software, Bible software program on my laptop that I can take with me uh, when I'm traveling. So uh, I've got resources in multiple formats, but, uh, you know, I love podcasts. I mean, our tech guys said to me not long ago, said, how many podcasts do you have on, on, your, uh, on your iPad? I said, eh, about 5,000 probably. <laughs> <laughs> You know, just you know, just in case I need one. <laughs> what is a a book that you've read recently that you would recommend? 
Oh, gosh, I can't think of it. Uh, Mark Buchanan's book, I think it's called The Rest of God. Uh, it was an amazing book. I read it about two months ago. I was on a study break, and I felt my life was really out of rhythm and uh, that I, I was not in a good season. I was way too busy saying yes too much. And I just I, I went on a study break not to work on any sermons, not to write any book, but just to read and to listen. And that was the first one I picked up, and it consumed me. I mean, it made me really think, do you rest, and do you understand what rest is, and do you understand seasons and rhythms and conditioning and all of that of your heart and of your mind? And and I had to come back and, and make some changes in just the way I schedule just from reading that because I got convicted by it. What is a uh, purchase of $100 or less that you've made that's that's had a profound impact on your life? You're not going to believe this. Uh, it was a chipper that I bought at the McGregor factory outlet here in Albany for $14.1990. Yeah, you can it explain cut, that one. It, it's cut three to five strokes off of my game. I still use it. <laughs> The grooves are almost out of it, but I can hit it. I can. I've, I know that club so well. I can hit it anywhere from 110 to 10 yards. So that's improved your golf game, which allows you to network better. But it also probably cuts down your temptation to have a bad attitude. Well, it 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 it, it makes me have a more positive attitude on the golf course and not have to apologize to my playing partners. There, there you go. Okay, that makes sense. <laughs> a good golf club. <laughs> And I'll give you one more that I made under 100. Uh, I have a first edition, four-volume set of Spurgeon's autobiography signed by his widow with a letter from her to a donor at the Metropolitan Tabernacle in London when Spurgeon was the pastor. Four-volume, first edition, printed in the 1800s, and I paid $100 for it. Yeah, probably not off of eBay. Uh, no, no. Uh, I was the book salesman was a stranger, and I took him in. <laughs> <laughs> well played. Where can people uh, connect with you or learn more about what you or Sherwood's doing? Uh, I have michaelcat.com. dot uh, com. That's where a lot of articles and resources and my schedule are all on there, and also on Twitter, it's Michael Cat, and and uh, there's a there's a Facebook page too. So all three of those are are out there. Excellent. Well, we'll be sure to put those in the uh, show notes so people can check those out. And what is the uh, what is your golf club? What what kind of golf club is it? It was a Jack Nicholas McGregor Chipper. They they actually have started making them again. Several companies make them. It has a seven iron loft on it. So fourteen dollars, the best club I've ever bought, especially when drivers are three hundred ninety nine dollars now. So you've been very successful in a lot of different uh, areas being a, an author, a pastor, a movie producer, but if you could do something that you're not currently doing, if you were forced to do something else, what job would you like to have or what profession would you like to have if you could do anything? I would like to be a college coach because of the way that you get to influence young men's lives for the next 40 years of who they are and what they become. I, I just think coaches have the best platform in the world uh, to influence people. If they're the right kind of coach with the right kind of attitude and the right values. Um, I told Mark Rick several years ago when he was in Facing the Giants, I said, Mark, I said, you know, people are running from the church. They're running from God. And so that we're building $100 million, $500 million, billion-dollar sports facilities, and they're really worship centers because people come to worship their teams. And I said, and so what God does, because he never leaves man with an excuse, God puts a guy like you on a sideline and says, try to get around him. So would you be a football coach? I would probably, yes, football or basketball, one or the other. Excellent. Well, we definitely appreciate your time today. We know you're busy, and, and thank you for those insights. Those were very good. Thank you, Jamie. I appreciate it. I hope that you enjoyed listening to Michael Catt as much as I did today. He's doing a lot to impact lives, whether it's through his Sunday sermons, books, 
the conferences that he runs, or the movies that he produces. He's also doing a lot in the way of trying to bring harmony, healing, and unity to communities. I encourage you to follow him on Twitter. Also, you probably know somebody that likes the movies Facing the Giants or Fireproof or Courageous. If so, please share this episode with them. Thanks so much, and until next time, remember that success is a choice. What choice will you make today? Today.